something like Gig Buddies, you know, going to mainstream venues has just been fantastic. I think both for the buddy and for the other people at the venue because, again, it's just a whole lot of people there enjoying themselves and having a good time. G'day, I'm Deborah Caldo, and welcome to the Red Giraffe Solutions Expanding Worlds podcast, where we aim to support you as you help your young person with additional needs plan for their future. A future where they are safe, secure, and live a rewarding and fulfilling life. From around the world, I share stories and share solutions from people making this possible right now. I'm a parent of a young person with additional needs, so I understand the challenges. Many of the people I've interviewed on this podcast have already helped me design a better future for my daughter and I hope that they might help you as well to imagine what's possible for your young person. I can't say how my daughter feels about relationships and making friends but I do know that at her age I would have never wanted to go out with my parents to concerts or things like that. That's why I like the idea of Gig Buddies so much because the premise is very simple enabling people with additional needs to make friends and be part of their community by matching them with volunteers that have similar interests to them. My daughter has a buddy, and although it does mean I miss the occasional concert I would like to go to, it's worth it to see her and her gig buddy developing a genuine friendship, and along the way my daughter learning those relationship skills that she's often struggled with. I first heard of gig buddies in 2019, and if you want to hear how it all started, listen to episode 68, titled Stay Up Late, with Paul Richards, the founder. Since it started in 2013, it's grown a lot, and it's now all over the UK, as well as in Ireland, New Zealand and Australia. In this episode, I'm talking with Carol Smale from Gig Buddies Sydney. Carol's background was in hospitality, but after going back to university, she found herself on a field placement working in a prison, supporting young people, many who had additional needs. When she then moved to Sydney, she took a job as a support worker, then very quickly moved to a service coordinator role, and then to the CEO of ACL Disability Services, which is a small service provider, and Gig Buddies is part of what they do. Carol and I talked about how Gig Buddies works, some of the challenges around finding the right volunteers, making sure that people are matched so that works as well, and the wider role Gig Buddies plays in changing attitudes. But let's start at the beginning. Carol, can you tell me how Gig Buddies Sydney got started? There was no planning in this, but I went to the UK and met Paul, who was doing, they were really just getting off the ground. So they would have been in their first year, and I had no idea about Gig Buddies, and I just got talking. Because Gig Buddies was still quite a small thing, and it was pretty much around his kitchen table at that stage, or in a very tiny office. You know, I just thought, wow, this is amazing. And I was thinking about it, and thinking about it, and on the very last day, he said to me, well, Carol, why don't you do Gig Buddies in Sydney? And I, and that was, it was, I was literally leaving to go to Heathrow. So I came back, and it's just sometimes the, the planets kind of get in line for you. Because when I came back, the first day back at work, I got an email from the city of Sydney. That they were doing this project called Live Music Matters because they were very concerned that a lot of venues in the city were closing or weren't being supported because people were no longer going to see live music and so they send out this thing to all not-for-profits saying listen do you have any ideas or how could you help us and when I read through the brief it was all about kind of the built environment you know they were concerned because a lot of heritage buildings in Sydney we can't put in ramps you know we can't and I looked at the document and I thought there's absolutely nothing in here about learning disability you're missing a whole cohort of people so I put in a submission, it's like a page and a half, and just said, look, here's this project in the UK, this is the premise, I'd quite like to do this here, and this is about this whole group of people that are untapped, you know, they're going to come to the music, they're going to want to have a drink, have a meal, spend money, what about them? Anyway, a couple of days later, I get a call, and they said, oh, Carol, do you want to come in and talk to us? We quite like your idea. And so I went in and they said, yeah, we're... We're having a council meeting tonight, so we're going to put this proposal forward to fund you. And we'll let you know. And the next day I got a call and they said it's unanimous. So they got us started. And that was just, again, you know, meeting Paul, going to that conference in Birmingham, meeting Paul, spending time with him, coming back. 
and the council going with us. And they just thought it was, you know, I mean, from a simple, again, it's with Geek Buddies, you love the simple thing, don't you? You know, because it's not a complex thing. It's a simple thing. How do people find out about Geek Buddies? You do marketing to people in the disability community? Yeah. How do you market to to get volunteers? What's that sort of process? I would say that 80% of it is social media. A lot of venues promote us, like a lot of music venues, um, sporting organisations. There's just all sorts of ways. The volunteers, a lot of them say to us word of mouth, like they're friends. When we ask them, why did you, we ask on the form, you know, why did you volunteer for, for us? Where did you hear about us? You know, and you get those general comments. But the other thing is, a lot of people say, look, I go to venues, I go, I go to see music, I go to watch the Swans play or go to the cricket. And nobody in my family or my friends group are into this music or like this team. So it'd be really great to have someone to go with who is actually a supporter that I could talk to about. And that's been some of those really successful matches where there's that commonality of, you know, that passion for something that people can share. Is it the same as the UK where you sort of say to people once a month or...? When people sign up and we match them, we say, you know, like there's an expectation that you'll do this for a year, like commit for a year and yeah, once a month. And once a month may not necessarily be going out and that was particularly the case during COVID, but it might be FaceTiming or just going for a coffee or having a chat on the phone or playing a game together, you know, online or something. But there is that connection is there. What's your age range that you've got? mainly older people, mainly younger people? 18 to 60, nearly 70, and both buddies and volunteers. If you sort of took an average, what would be your kind of might It would be a male and, and a buddy and a male in their sort of mid-20s to mid-30s and with volunteers, and this is an issue for us, a female in that kind of same cohort we we really desperately need more male volunteers we, we try very hard to make the right match because we don't want to have a situation where you're just going well we'll just match these people you know because it's not going to work out and I think for a lot of young males as well and they've gone to school and they've been told listen you can do anything that your peers can do and then the minute they leave school just off the cliff you know post school options I mean they shouldn't even say that use that phrase because it's not even a thing and the number of times that we've had parents say to us my son left school you know when he when he finished year 11 year 12 all his friends you know in the class without disabilities all went and did a gap year or they went to uni or they went um, they went you know overseas they did something else and you know they all said yeah yeah we'll catch up but it all drops away because they're getting on with their lives and I think particularly for young males, they tend not to be, we notice it from the female gig buddies to the male gig buddies, they're not as good as the, at the networking that the females are. Females, so a lot of our female gig buddies in that age cohort are incredibly savvy about keep catching up and networking, you know, all this, they're right across it. And so we quite often get, you know, we'll do the first meeting with a new gig buddy who's signed up and his parent will say, you know, my son's been sitting in his bedroom on his laptop for the last two or three years and he's really lonely, you know, and he just needs to have a friend. You know, he's not his brother, he's not his cousin, he's not me taking him out to gigs, you know. It's got to, he wants to, he wants to do what all these other people are doing. Why do you think you don't get as many young men becoming volunteers then? I don't know. I mean, because the male buddies, the male volunteers that we've got are just extraordinary. And it's nothing to do with how busy their lives are. We, we just find it incredibly difficult to get Do you think that changes? Because what I've, I've gathered here that there's a, a push towards being in mainstream as opposed mm. to having special schools. Yeah. Do you think that'll change over time as more young men... Maybe. Contact with yeah, other people. maybe. I mean, this is the thing as well that a lot, and particularly going back in the day, a lot of the volunteers had never had any contact or meaningful contact, relate any kind of level of relationship with a person with a disability, particularly with a learning disability. 
I mean, may, maybe that, that, that will happen. I mean, the classic thing was we, when we started doing our birthday parties, I think it was our, might have been our second birthday party, and we were in Roselle and there was a pub there and we thought, oh, that would be good to have a birthday party. So we went, Matt went and spoke to the publican and said, look, we've probably got about 50 people that are coming. Um, we're a disability org. And the guy said to him, oh, no, not, not in my pub, mate. You know, he said, I, I don't want to scare off the locals. You know, I'm, I'm, I can see you doing a good thing, but, you know, it's not for us. So Matt said, OK, thank you very much. So on the Friday night, um, two gig buddies and two volunteers went and had dinner there and watched the live band. And on Monday, Matt rang the publican and said, I just want to say, you know, two of our buddies and two of our volunteers came and spent the night, the Friday night there, had a lovely meal and really loved your live music. Thank you very much. They just want me to ring and compliment you. And he said, well, I didn't notice them. <laughs> Matt said, I just wanted to say, well, they don't actually have two heads, you know. But, you know, this is the thing. And then so he said, oh, look, maybe I was a bit hasty. So we had our second birthday party there. And you do have the thing where sometimes you go, why should I give that person our patronage? But at the same time, you want to change attitudes. And so we had a party there, 50 people, and everybody had a brilliant time. And at the end of the night, the publican came and said, you've been one of the best groups we've ever had. Thank you so much. Because we're all there. Everyone's buying a meal. Everyone's buying a drink. It's a really good lesson, I think, in how you approach these things, that you don't jump up and down and say, I'm going to sue you or, you know, I'm going to go to the press or whatever and that's much more effective and I think something like Gig Buddies you know going to mainstream venues has just been you know fantastic I think both for the buddy and for the other people at the venue because again it's just a whole lot of people there enjoying themselves and having a good time yeah there's a lot of things that you learn I think it'll never be a project that you just go well this is it this is what it looks like it's always constantly evolving I think that final story from Carol pretty much sums up why Gig Buddies is so amazing. Because it not only connects people, but it also has the potential for a much wider impact in terms of changing attitudes. There are links to the various Gig Buddies websites in the show notes. And if you have a Gig Buddies project near you, then honestly, get in touch with them. Because I can say from my own personal experience, this has had such a positive impact on my daughter. And if you don't have a Gig Buddies near you, then you can start your own up. They offer a licensing scheme so you can take advantage of the fact they've done all the hard work. So why not use their expertise rather than starting a similar project from scratch? Gig Buddies has four principles. And my favourite as a parent is number four. Friendship, having people in your life who aren't paid to be there. When I think about my daughter's future without me, this is something I know I want her to have. I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to listen. And I hope that the stories and the solutions shared on here help you as you support your young person to create their future. And if you know anyone who would find the ideas useful, please share the podcast with them. Of course, if you want to, you can leave a review because that is another way families who need this information can find it more easily. This show is created as part of Red Giraffe Solutions. To find out what the Red Giraffe is all about, visit redgiraffesolutions.com where you'll find more resources around daily living, relationships, purpose, and financial security. I'm at Deborah Caldo on Instagram and Facebook. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to have a conversation with you on any of those. Bye for now.